Hello, and welcome to the 60 for 30 project. My name is Xander Miller with Kenosha Public Library. I'm sitting here with Krista Maurer. Hi, Hi Krista. Xander. How are you doing? Good, thank you. Awesome, that's great to hear. So, we'll just get started right away. Um, so, what neighborhood are you um, from or are you currently living around? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. So, I am currently living in Uptown in Lincoln neighborhood. Mm -hmm. They call it the Brass, Lincoln, and Uptown neighborhood. Yeah, how, I've, I've heard that a few times. I'm just like, which is, wait, Brass, Lincoln, and Uptown, they're three different ones or they're one and the same? So, so I really don't know the formal history. I only know the 50-year-ago history, right? Mm -hmm. So um, that neighborhood has really changed so much over time. And, um, I, you know, because Lincoln Park is there, so mm -hmm. that's a Lincoln neighborhood. Uh, Lincoln School was there, now it is K-Tech. Mm -hmm. Lincoln Middle School is still there, it used to be Lincoln Junior High. So I think that what we do in Kenosha, this is my thoughts, is that we name the neighborhoods by the churches and schools there of the surroundings. So, mm -hmm. And then Uptown, of course, was just the strip on the 22nd. Avenue from 63rd all the way to 60th Street mm -hmm. and that back in the day was businesses so I think that's where that came from okay. and then we kind of enmeshed it those neighbors that live there so we just kind of put everything together I do though currently have parents that live in that neighborhood and children so yes Sander I know I'm <laughs> quite uh, young looking but yeah my children actually own homes in that neighborhood as well okay yeah that's neat. So, what do you think is Kenosha's culture, or what have you experienced as Kenosha's culture? So, uh, wow, that question <laughs> is so convoluted. Um, it could mean so many different things to so many different people. So, I'm going to tell you what that means to me. Okay. So, Kenosha, Kenosha's culture in in so many uh in so many words is i want to say eclectic so when you look at kenosha as a whole and i've been south side north side west side mm -hmm. it it's almost a, a mosaic if you will however do you know how like when you have the mosaic pieces mm -hmm. in hand yeah, and yeah. you're putting it together maybe on a window or around a lamp um, I feel like certain pieces go in certain places. Does that make sense? So it's like, you know, you've got the pieces, all, you've got all the pieces and it, it only goes one spot. Is and that it only goes saying? one spot. Yeah. So I, it depends on if I'm talking about economics, right? What I think of Kenosha's culture is, I think that we're a thriving um, uh, 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 economic vitality spot where People can come and develop and 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 support jobs here mm -hmm. and whatnot. Uh, when we talk about the have and the have nots, like in society or in a social order type of way, I feel like there are definitely have nots, and then there's definitely haves in Kenosha. Um, and then uh, if we're talking about race, right? I feel like it. it it's def uh, somebody had told me that it was 11% of African Americans are in Kenosha. Mm -hmm. And you know where I grew up, it just seemed like it was 80%. So <laughs> I didn't know that there was only 11% in Kenosha or 17%. Maybe it went up 17%. I hate to start with numbers because then you get pinpointed for what you say. But... Um, so I think so. I, the best word that I could come up with is eclectic because I think that my overall experience in Kenosha has been very challenging mm -hmm. um, for different reasons. But it goes year by year and seasons by seasons. I would say decades by decades now, and um, uh, I think it, it some of that could change. And I think some of it, depending on what lens you look out of, um, has changed. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's take a, a dive into there. Sure. A little bit. Let's so do it. Yeah. When you're, you know, when you're younger, um, even younger. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So how was how was it 
back then in terms of either economy, race, you know, social yeah. community? How was that? So let me just tell you about my experience, okay? So I grew up over there in Uptown in Lincoln neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And my parents are Italian-American. And um, my mother, hey, she has a story, I love it. She bought the house, not she, her father bought the house. Her father worked at Brass. Her mother at American Motors. Um, factory workers from Italy, mm -hmm. right? Uh, bought our house in the Uptown Lincoln neighborhood for three thousand dollars. Love, yeah, love it. And we still live in that home right wow. now to this day. Yes. So, anyways, moving forward, um, I was a young uh, scholar, if you would. I walked to school. You know, my mom worked three jobs. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were surrounded in our neighborhood by a lot of Italian and Polish folks. Um, I remember actually when the times of change, I was nine years old, and Mari lit, um, moved in back next door. And uh, the next door neighbors moved out. And those were, uh, again, from the old country Italian folks. Mm -hmm. And they moved out. It was a loss for my mom and a loss for us because we were pretty close. Um, but Madi brought her Hispanic American family in and, uh, and we, were, we were best friends. To this day, we were best friends. And then I also made good friends with Gabby Perez and other people, you know, that we were uh, surrounded with. So that neighborhood constantly changed of culture. Mm -hmm. um, and as a student, I went to Lincoln and Lincoln Junior High, yep. and uh, and the it, it, I remember it being so cultured, if you will. So I remember my friends being uh, from different races and and different religions, and it was I don't know they were just. Uh, I remember like some skater guys and some jocks, right? Like I just remember it was so eclectic, if mm -hmm. you will. Um, I was into uh, wearing like jean jackets and concert t-shirts, oh, but still listening jackets. to rap, you know, <laughs> like I loved the TLC back then and, and, um, and then other things, you know, uh, other rap groups. So, I mean, everybody was kind of, I, I don't know, I just remember people were a little bit more accepting of of who and what everyone was, um, but I do want to say this: labels ran rapidly, rampantly, rampantly in the seasons of change in the neighborhood and also in the school systems. And uh, I saw a lot of disadvantage. So even as a child. I saw the community um, maybe not maybe not be so fair to certain races or certain genders. Um, uh, for instance, uh, my mother had to carry three jobs to take care of us, right? Mm -hmm. um, my my dad only had one, and uh, and they were divorced, and and my dad lived in Forest Park, and my mom was in the hood. We called it, you know. Uh, so I saw that disadvantage, right? I mm -hmm. saw the disadvantage of that. Then I also got to see the, um, the educational disadvantage. So I got to see my dad who had a bachelor's degree and my mother who did not. And she, how, how hard, excuse me, how hard she had to work. Um, and, and that how my dad went to a nine to five job and came home, you know, that he really didn't care about. Um, my dad lasted 32 years at his job, and my mom jumped around and, and did what she could. We, we called her a little hustler, you know, because she just, <laughs> she just went around and cleaned people and, and made clothing and, did, and cooked. And, you know, she was very smart, but um, when you're undereducated, what are you, you going to do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I do want to leave that story with my mom was a non-traditional student and at 50 went back to school. So I do want to say that, but um, uh, so I saw many disadvantages with race as well. So because I was in an inner city school um, mm -hmm. with elementary and, and junior high, I got to see 
the different races get different treatment and it wasn't always great treatment. So as what I thought would be maybe something little like a hall pass or something like that, or if I was in the hall without one, for instance, um, I was, it was okay. And uh, if my friend Tyrone was in the hall without a pass, he got expelled or, or you know, or, or suspended for sure, talked to, pulled into the office. Things like that were just really weird. Just for a hall pass? Just, yeah, just little, little things like that. Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah. There were other things, too, that I remember that was not so fair. Um, test giving, um, you know, uh, the truancy issue, right? So some kids were trying to get to school. I remember so many times they were trying to get to school. We'd walk to go pick up some kids on 15th and uh, on 14th, and we'd get there late, and, and teachers would send the kids out, say, no, you can't come in the class and t you know, without a pass. That kind of stuff was just so weird. It was just so crazy to me um, to see how being five minutes late to school was such a, you know, they just got sanctioned so much. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, uh, so I, it, it became apparent that there was a difference, if you will. Okay. Um, later in junior high, my latter years of junior high, uh, I became... I don't know. I became uh, intrigued, if you will, for lack of better words, <laughs> to to be an advocate. You know, to um, to to watch people that you love and care about, or or you kick it with on the soccer team, or you go and play tennis at you know Lincoln Park, or even ball for that. You know, basketball. Mm -hmm. I used to have little shots <laughs> and. Uh, and, and to see them treated badly, you know, I, I wanted to stick up for them. I thought that they needed somebody to, to, to say, you know, this stuff is not okay and we're going to rally, if you will. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't somebody who, like, starts disruption. But I will, I always say, like, there's such power in the speaking of people, right, in, in your tongue, if you will, mm -hmm. that... Um, I began to be one of those people and advocate for, or be an advocate to people who needed um, maybe someone to think about what the heck they're saying or what they're doing or why they're making choices like they are. So um, my friends took that very well, obviously. <laughs> um, but I think that, maybe not now, but I think that when I was a a kid when I was younger, um, the social justice issue was so huge, you know. Um, and I was a teen mom, Xander, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about this. Okay. So um, I was a teen mom, Italian American, you know, that mm -hmm. I am, and I um, had a child by a man who was of color. Okay. So he was African American and our child is biracial. And our child was so beautiful when she was born, just amazing. And for the very first time, I was able to see the discriminatory acts of Kenosha. Um, for instance, when I was uh, in the hospital and we gave birth, um, my child had white on her birth certificate and I didn't really know anything about anything, you know, like uh, how they identified that. However, when I asked about that race and why it said white, because he's clearly not white, mm -hmm. you know, and how does this go, right? Because you kind of are, um, the nurse and the doctor both said, no, this is you know, the mother's white, so that's what we're going to put. They went, that's just all they used? That's all it There's was. There's no this biracial was, There was race. no biracial. There was no even black. Like, I even heard from his side of the family that 
there was a one drop law. Like if you were black, you got, you know, this is what it was. If you had one drop that you were black on your birth certificate, and that was not the case, by the way. So, and that might have changed with decades. But mm -hmm. anyways, um, so yeah, so that was foreign uh, to me. And that's where it started. I think that's, that's where, besides the fact of my friends and the neighborhood in which I lived and what, that's when I started really noticing that the labels came out over and over again. So um, injustice and um, civil injustice mm -hmm. and social injustice. And that was just a little bit. Um, that was in the 80s at the end of the 80s, and then we got into the 90s when I was raising the child, right? So listen, we tried our best. We tried <laughs> our best to be good parents, but let me tell you right now, there is no such thing as a good parent. So all this <laughs> other stuff going on in society, like, oh, you should do that, that they're lying. They're, you, you know, it's trial and error, especially with the first one. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it, it, you, you really start thinking, though, in the 80s when you had a biracial child, you really start thinking about what's the best for that child um, in different ways. So my mom had to think about different ways to provide for us, right, and make sure we were safe and, and uh, things like that. But I had to think about, we, him and I, had to think about, if we if we were you know providing for her if we if she was safe um, mm -hmm. in a safe environment if um, if if her ethnic and, and cultural background was um, provided I want to say or at the forefront mm -hmm. of who she was and that was foreign to me that was really foreign that we had to take in um, the undertones and let me tell you more about that quickly. Okay. So, for instance, we um, chose to have her in a private school in kindergarten and first grade, mm -hmm. in a Kenosha private school. And during that time, I sat in on a lesson and outside the door, just wondering. Um, uh, my daughter kept coming home and, and saying prior to this that um, they're calling her a brown girl at school. And yes, she was a brown girl, beautiful brown girl. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, she was probably one of none. <laughs> she was the only one in that school um, that was biracial or that uh, people have seen that were black. And I remember just, you know, walking. We didn't have any transportation. We were teen parents. Mm -hmm. So walked up there and, and just listened um, outside the door and uh, her teacher was playing that scat music remember da 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 oh, I'm trying remember to remember it remember the scat it. man yeah so they had like scat music and um, she introduced that as part of the curriculum which was normal and and talking about um, how different musics and different what do you call it genres mm -hmm. right yep. um, and one of the things that she blatantly said in front of the whole entire class was, this guy is brown like Nina, and used my child's name, and went and touched her skin, and went back and forth. What? And I thought, yeah, and I thought to myself, now this was a teacher who had been there for years, 20 years, she was older, and I thought to myself, as a parent, how do you, now, mind you, right? I just told you about the advocacy and the, mm -hmm. the hunger that I had for it and the, the watch and the environment and the socially. Yeah, and now it's happening to my child. And uh, although I think he, the father, was definitely used to the discriminatory behavior and the racism, the blatant racism that happened in Kenosha, um, in, in different venues of his life, mm -hmm. he would warn me about that all the time. And I would say, is this what you're talking about? I didn't want to pretend like I knew what was going on, mm -hmm. um, like most of us do, right? Most of the white culture pretends that we know exactly where you're going with that, right? We know exactly 
what you're going through or all oh, the compassion. And really, we have no idea. Mm-hmm. We have no idea. Um, and it's okay to say that we don't have any idea, by the way. Um, so back to Nina, I remember her coming to me and saying, see, my, so I asked her, I said, well, on the way home, we walked back home, and I said, uh, how did that make you feel? You know, she told me about it, and I said, well, how did it make you feel? And she said, I don't know, Mom, it just makes me feel weird. And I said, yeah, those are, that's your insides. Those are your intuitions telling you that she shouldn't address you by your race. She's not, that's not acceptable. Mm-hmm. So we... I went up there the next day in the morning, talked to the principal. He thought that there was nothing nothing to talk about. He was totally okay with um, the teacher pointing her. And I explained, like, just the sensitivity of child development and how this may go and how this actually introduced a complex to my child. And that is not acceptable and or going to be tolerated mm-hmm. um, because it was a private school. Um, we just got into an argument with the, and, and I left. So I just, you know, just took my kid out. It was no big deal. I put her in Lincoln, uh, elementary and boy, was that something for her (laughs) too. (laughs) So she went to, um, from, you know, this private school to this, uh, public. Um, so she came home and said, oh my goodness, they're doing this and doing that in school. And I'm like, oh my God, what are we going to do? So, um. Anyways, uh, that was my first time of having to address something other than, oh, her hair is good hair, or, oh, she's so light, are you sure he's his? Okay? Um, Yes, so now we're looking at illegitimacy or or, um, legit, Mm -hmm. right? So, or or being legit. So it it was definitely opening for me to get on, I wanna say, the bus with, um, uh, social justice because yeah. of my children. And, and so how, how has that, those experiences help, you know, reach where you are now? Yeah, so those experiences have definitely, and, and to have just lived through them, I want to say, um, has definitely gave me a voice to the folks who maybe don't have a voice to say, or just have, um, you know those experiences and internalize them. Mm-hmm. So there's a there's a dual, you know, edge here. There's so many things that I went into social work after I went into teaching. Mm-hmm. I want to make sure that I'm present during these, and I did it on purpose. So anything that I have done in my life, I've done on purpose. I've done uh, social work in inner cities, Chicago, San Antonio, Milwaukee, on purpose mm-hmm. because those are the discriminatory. Uh, laws that we come up against, but I can advocate on behalf of um, a, a, ch- a youth, and that was my specialty is youth, but um, the youth maybe that needed more advocacy, um, and not uh, on a lawyer point of view, but as, you know, as some type of commonality on a social level. Okay. Um, so I think it's it's given me it's it's raised some concerns, and it's given me some go, if you will, some energy, to um, stand up for what's wrong, and and also come up with a a solution to mm-hmm. what we can do. So putting systems in place, programming in in uh, in the air part, if you will, um, identifying the needs. And then also coaching, teaching, training, guiding the youth that are going through this that definitely do not need to listen to society and the tags and name given to them, right? So walking in your uniqueness and the authenticity of the talents and skills that you have and looking inner and not outer and things like that. However, how do you, how do you change that Right? So that all sounds great, but how do you change that um, in society? So you help people get their voice, right? So you, you help a person like I uh, am, a person like me, I help youth start younger and um, I helped them get their voice. And, mm-hmm. and, and it started with social skills. First, we had to, you know, learn how to disagree appropriately and and 
and be emotionally um, detached from what was going on, which is the hardest thing in the world you could ever ask someone to do. Yeah. So you're being oppressed and that's okay with you and now you want me to have a voice? They used to say, Miss Mauer, what are you thinking? What are you doing? And I would say, let's role play. Let's do this. We can do this together. And I'm not sure, you know, I, it was like in the late 90s when different therapies came out and, and we were able to, especially in Milwaukee and Chicago, we were able to, you know, have kids um, attend therapy that way. But come on, let's be honest, you know, kids were not into that kind of stuff so so you know raising up others that would be that voice around them as well i always call it a wraparound system you mm -hmm. know if you can get a coach a teacher um a pastor anybody on your you know wavelength i want to say yeah, it's like a, having your own team yes you have to have an own team and if you think about it xander look about you know even though you and i probably have different um, stories and different experiences about growing up here in Kenosha. I always felt like, you know, our neighborhood, no matter, no matter what you did, wasn't good enough. Um, if you were a black male, no matter what you did. So, if you um, worked at the brass, if you worked at American Motors, it was still you were stupid and you had no skills. Um, if you worked on cars, you had to be like that because you were on drugs. Um, if you sold shoes out of the trunk of your car, it was because you didn't have any other way of getting it. You know, you stole those shoes or something like that. What? You know, what? I would tell people, what? This is, you know, this is a talent. This is a skill. This is wholesale. This is, mm -hmm. this is a, a talent and skill of a mechanic or this is a... You know, so it was very difficult, um, meanwhile, uh, trying to turn the connotation. Yeah, it's, it's part, it sounds like part of changing not only the perception of people and changing how they think, but then what you've worked with the kids especially is giving them their own way to make their own voice heard so that, you know, same situation, but now there's confidence in that voice. That's right. And that's, I think that's the greatest thing that um, when they see me now, because they're like 30. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so old. Um, yeah, now they're 30 and they always say that, uh, you know, that they have the confidence that they get to walk in mm -hmm. um, that meaningful life and have a really good quality of life. But they have made that. And, and the sadder part is, is not a lot of them stick around here mm -hmm. because People get tired of fighting, Xander. Yeah. They get tired of fighting. Why, why, why should we fight? Why should we have to fight, they say to me, Miss Mara. Why? When I could go to Atlanta or Chicago or New York and, and be welcomed in Milwaukee and feel like, you know, we have black teachers and black CEOs and black, you know, and I could go on even for the Hispanic population mm -hmm. and how, you know, they are um, very inclusive in that um in that culture, and here we are in Kenosha, still learning, and and it's not acceptable anymore. Mm -hmm. We need to move forward. So, if there's anything else to just wrap up here that you'd like Kenoshans to know or leadership to know, what would that be? So, you know, I think that there's enough meetings. Mm -hmm. I think that we've gotten to a point where we must start doing some actions right now. Um, this is 2021, and it's no longer okay to just throw bones. We have to continue to move forward. And there's some actionable items that need to be held accountable here in Kenosha. And I am going to sit at every table and try and make sure that that happens. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Krista, so much. Thank for you so much. Us.